Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for, for having me here today. Um, it's, it's really refreshing to be doing one of these presentations when somebody else has already had to, to feel the difficult questions about Amazon's taxation. So, <laughs> also, also refreshing to hear somebody prepared to say it's not their area of expertise in answer to a question. Um, that's not a luxury you, you get as an investor. And of course, we have an opinion on everything. So, um, <laughs> Um, if, there's, if there's one thing that I, um, I would like you to, to take away from what I've got to say today, it's that there is um, a phenomenal amount of change going on around us. And, and maybe we don't see it from one day to the next, but if you look over longer periods of time, um, the changes are, are really quite dramatic. And our, our aim in Scottish Mortgage um, and indeed the Bailey Gifford American Fund, which, which I also co-manage, is to identify the, the companies and individuals that are, that are driving those um, changes, the founder managers, the entrepreneurs. And where we find these people, we aim to be very long-term, very loyal shareholders. And the good news is there are some phenomenal businesses out there um, companies that have, have turned out to be much more powerful than we, than we dare to imagine. Um, and in our view, they have the capability to deliver really fantastic returns over the next five or ten years. So I'm going to use my slot this morning to, to tell you a little bit about how we've reached that conclusion. So the starting uh, point for this um, is that I think the scale and ubiquity of uh, today's internet, uh, driven by mobile, mobile devices, is really still only dimly uh, perceived. Um, I think it's increasingly wrong to think about um, the internet only in, in the context of the large technology companies. Um, I think it affects just about every business that, that we look at. So there are about five and a half billion people on the planet over the age of um, 14. There are now over 3 billion mobile, internet-enabled mobile devices. And the size of that potential market means we have to redefine uh, what we mean when we talk about a large company. So if you look at Microsoft and Intel, um, in the, at the, the peak of the, the Windows Intel dominance in the, in the mid-90s, um, they didn't make it into the top 10 companies in America. Today, um, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon are all in, in the top five. Um, think about their spending. They, they spent $30 billion on CapEx between them last year. Um, a decade ago, that number would have been $1 billion. Now, the, the changes that they've brought have, have been focused thus far on two industries, um, retail and, and media. And I believe it's still really early um, in, in both of, of those two industries, whether it's Amazon in retail um, that, we, that we heard about from Natalie, or Alphabet or Facebook in media and advertising. I think there's still a great deal more to go for in, in the core. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about, about Amazon. Um, it's, it's the largest holding in, in Scottish mortgage. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it anymore other than to say that, that I think the idea that, that it will stop at less than 1.5% of, of US retail sales where we are today um, is, is not one that, that I believe in. Um, similarly, Google, Facebook, um, as their share of our attention continues to increase and the model of traditional broadcast media starts to, starts to crack. Um, it's amazing to me that, Amazon, uh, that Alphabet has, has built a $100 billion business and yet, over the past five years, other forms of advertising have actually continued to grow. Um, so we still haven't seen this, this much heralded um, um, change in, in the advertising industry. But it's not the progress of these companies in their core markets um, that seems to me likely to be most important if you look out over the next 10 years. Another way to understand these companies is that they have acquired a fundamental skill. Whether that's through search or retail or social curation, they have gained the ability to ingest huge volumes of information. 
and to make sense of it very rapidly and to, to make decisions about it. Um, and that's what really people mean when they, when they start talking about machine learning. And if that's the skill set of these companies, then it applies well, well beyond that core. It's this mental model which allows us to understand why Google, as an, an online search uh, company, has become the world leader in self-driving cars. It's able to ingest the huge volumes of data that are produced by a modern sensor suite, make sense of them, make decisions, and, and operate the controls of the vehicle. But if you take that one fairly narrow application of, of this technology, um, just think, of, think about the implications if, if Google and, and Tesla push, push the market into full autonomy. Um, you know, impact on oil demand is, is, is maybe one of the obvious ones to think about. Um, but um, you know, what, what happens to the ownership of the vehicle fleet in this situation? Um, who is going to insure it? Um, what happens to congestion? Because if you change congestion patterns in our cities, then you change real estate values. Um, and I, I, I could go on like this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the epicenter of, of this technology-led revolution, um, about what's to, to come in media, um, touch, touch briefly on retail, but, but specifically in China. Um, and then I want to talk about some of the, the other areas where, where we see potential for significant developments over the next decade. So starting with the, uh, with the media industry, um, I thought I'd, I'd take a, a challenging example and talk a bit about Facebook. Um, it's, it's been in the headlines for all the wrong reasons of late. Um, it's a holding for us, although we, we were reducing it at, at the back end of, of last year. Um, but I thought I'd try to answer the question, what, what do all these negative headlines mean? Um, it, are we starting to see this technology-led revolution in, in the media industry um, come, come to a halt? And I think in, in answering that question, you have to distinguish between Facebook the business and Facebook the product. Facebook's product has been under a lot of, of scrutiny recently, um, but Facebook's business um, continues to operate very successfully. There's very little evidence that the issues that are affecting its product are, are feeding through into, into business problems. The second thing you, you have to bear in mind when you think about this um, is uh, that Facebook has picked a fight with the news media industry. So the changes it made um, to its algorithm at, at the end of the last year slashed online distribution um, for, for most news websites. And as a result, it, it hit, hit their revenues directly. So you have to bear that in mind when you, when you read all the gleeful headlines about, about Facebook's problems. And of course, that also hints at a pretty easy fix for them um, if, if they want to change the narrative. Um, but to my mind, Facebook's issues have, have three components. Um, the first is, is around massive scale abuse of the platform. So, so for example, to, to influence election outcomes. Um, now, that's, a, and that's an issue actually that's, that's largely historic. So even the, the latest Cambridge Analytica scandal um, relates to, to issues in the product before 2014. So I think what you really need to see here is just a bit of time uh, to elapse without any significant um, um, further issues. Um, so things like the, the, the Italian election, where there's, there's no suggestion of, of these platforms being used to influence the outcome. The second issue is around freedom of expression versus hate speech. And I think that's where Facebook's huge relative advantage is clear. Um, what other media, on a co uh, re media company on earth could hire 10,000 extra people um, to, to moderate the content on its site? Um, and then the third issue, which I think is, is lowest profile, but to my mind is, is probably the most important one, um, is whether its users get value um, from their experience of the product. Now, if you take all those three issues together, um, I think they, they all have the potential to, to undermine the company. But what we take great comfort from as, as ongoing shareholders is that there's a founder CEO in charge with a large personal equity stake in the business. And that's the, the mechanism whereby the company can prioritize addressing uh, these types of issues 
and invest in a significant amount of time and, and resource um, in, in, in changing the course of the development, even if that means forgoing profitability in the short run, um, because long-run value creation and short-run profitability aren't the same thing. Um, and that's some, something that founder owners with a significant um, stake in their business um, really viscerally understand. So the question for us, as always, is how do we make a significant return uh, from here? Now, Facebook has a vast audience. There isn't, there isn't really any sign of that changing. If you look on the slide at the combined share of, of Facebook and Instagram, you can see dominance across a, a huge range of markets. And that huge audience spends about 40 minutes of time each day on the platform. Um, yet the advertising revenue uh, from that attention remains derisory. Um, Facebook made about $6 off each of its users in the fourth quarter. Um, but in the US, if you just take the US carve out of, of that user base, they made about $27. Um, so you can see by the rest of the world merely catching up with the US, um, this is a business that could be making five times the revenue that it is today. Um, but actually there's also another really important um, trend which is the specificity of the advertising, the ability to target adverts to people who'd be interested in a product. And that's driving huge growth in, in pricing. Um, it is for very good reason that Facebook and Google between them are taking 100% of all the incremental dollars that, that are being spent on, on online advertising. Um, and our judgment is that the, the, there is no fundamental change in the, the scale of the opportunity in media. At some point, uh, the power of that audience of two billion people um, will reassert itself. Um, and as for, for the stock price, um, one of the most important things for a, for a long-term investor is simply to be able to endure, because no business will ever enjoy only positive news flow. Um, now, as I, as I mentioned, um, I'm not going to talk about uh, retail in the West. Um, I know far less about it than, than Natalie. Um, but I did want to talk briefly um, about Alibaba. And I think I can justify this um, not only because China is different, but also um, it would be um, far too narrow a definition of the opportunity um, to, to call Alibaba just a retailer. Really, it is a proxy for the consumer economy in China, the whole of the, the SME sector. On its busiest promotional days, Alibaba will sell uh, more product on its one website than will be sold on all UK websites and in all UK shops over the next fortnight. Um, and what's interesting is that Alibaba's management don't even see that as an achievement. Instead, they see it as a useful opportunity to stress test uh, their systems for what they expect to be volumes every day if you look out five years from now. Um, and those sales volumes are about five times larger than you, than you saw taken across all the US websites on Cyber Monday, for example. So Alibaba um, leads the, the world of e-commerce by a huge margin. But there's something else going on here. Um, Alibaba is one of the largest online media platforms in China. So it owns um, Weibo, which is one of the largest social networking sites. Um, it owns Yuku Tudao, which is one of the biggest online video sites. Um, so it delivers top of the funnel advertising, promotion. Um, it can analyze consumer behavior. It can predict demand. And it's also expanding very rapidly beyond um, traditional e-commerce. So its finance platform has 450 million users. It processes about 300 million transactions a day. And it's using its reputation to, to grow into business areas like wealth management, um, insurance. It's a real example of a, a fintech company that is using better products and services to bypass the, the traditional financial system. So you want an example of that. Um, the company announced in the spring that it was now the manager of the world's largest money market fund. $165 billion. Um, it took Bailey Gifford, uh, where, where I work, um, about 100 years to get to $165 billion. Um, these guys started in 2013. Um, 
Now, having a, a, a combining social data, advertising, transaction, payments, delivery, um, real identity. This is a company that has a, a closed data loop, which is the envy of the online world. Um, this allows it to study, train its uh, machine learning algorithms uh, on consumer behavior right through from demand generation to completed transactions. And it does that all based on, on real identity. It then operates in a regulatory regime which allows it to, to use this data in any way it wants. Um, and you can already think, see things like um, credit scoring or bank lending um, are being done in a way which is achieving far superior results to, to anything we've seen before in the West. Now, I want to um, move on from, from media retail um, and um, possibly to this more exciting trend from an investor's perspective, which is that the technologies that have underpinned some of, of these huge changes um, and the, the transformation in those sectors being applied to um, sectors which are, are used to a much more pedestrian um, pace of progress. So, start with the, the transport industry. Um, I think it's increasingly obvious that the scandal at um, Volkswagen has um, accelerated the timeline for the demise of the internal combustion engine. And I think that happens regardless of um, the, the Trump agenda. So we've had cities like Paris, Athens, Mexico City already said that they'll be banning diesel vehicles from their city centres by 2025. And the evidence um, for, the, for the public health benefits of taking this sort of action is really pretty um, compelling. If you, if you think it's a high-profile set of issues here, um, then you should speak to a resident of, of Beijing or, or Delhi. Just breathing the air in Delhi for a day is as bad as smoking um, 40 cigarettes for, for your health. Um, and that's the background to the huge opportunity that Tesla addresses over the next decade. Because as battery costs, battery technology continues to improve, costs continue to, to decline, um, electrification of the, the passenger vehicle fleet um, and the broader logistics industry will accelerate. Um, and at the same time, software is becoming a, a much larger component of, of the value in, in the vehicle and therefore the source of competitive differentiation. And what you have in Tesla is um, a software company competing in a traditional engineering industry. You have a driven leader whose fortunes are highly correlated um, to Tesla's long-term long success, um, driving change in an industry where very little changes. You have a non-unionized workforce pursuing a direct-to-consumer business model um, in an industry where independent dealers own the relationships with the customers, um, not, not the equipment manufacturers. Now, Tesla has um, faced some, some challenges in ramping the production of its, its mass-market vehicle, the Model 3. Um, it's, it's now rapidly overcoming some of those problems. Um, they're aiming to get to about 5,000 vehicles a week by, by the end of June. If they, if they achieve that, that will be the fastest ramp of um, a new vehicle platform since the, the Ford Model T in the early 1900s. And the aim is to get to about 500,000 units of output per annum. And the opportunity, if they can do that, is absolutely massive. Um, the company announced the launch of the Model 3 about two years ago. Um, they took 400,000 pre-orders in the subsequent um, three weeks. And that's about as many... Um, um, units as BMW will sell of its, its three series in a year. And that was done despite absolutely no marketing. It was a single tweet um, from, from the company's CEO. And it's done everything ever it can do ever since to, um, to depress demand. You won't see an advert for this vehicle anywhere. If you, if you go into a Tesla store, um, the, the salespeople will try to talk to you about something else. Um, but because it, it's going to take them so long to, to fulfill that existing um, demand. But what, what gives me great optimism about the company is, despite the fact that the, the production has been slower to build than we might have hoped, um, there's no sign of anybody trying to compete in this market. We were expecting BMW's Tesla killer to arrive at the Frankfurt Motor Show last autumn. Uh, no sign of it. Um, there have been product announcements from, from lots of other companies, most notably Volvo, but there aren't any products. Um, Tesla's lead isn't, isn't being eroded. 
This is a classic um, example of, of the innovator's dilemma. It's almost impossible for the traditional industry to respond to the challenge. And you can see in, in the chart on this slide, eight years after the launch of the Model S, it's still the number one in the, in the luxury sedan segment, and, and no one else is coming close. So we think revolution in the automotive industry is, is coming, um, but an even more important industry is starting to see similar trends, and that is healthcare. I think we're on the cusp of some really quite dramatic progress in, in healthcare, um, specifically the way we, we treat cancer. Now, the current treatment paradigm is built um, around the idea of standard of care, that there is a best course of treatment for everyone. Um, the standard of care approach makes sense in lots of settings, um, but cancer isn't one of them. So you can, you can see in the chart on the slide this rather astonishing result that for any given cancer drug, about three quarters of the people that take it will see no clinical benefit whatsoever. Um, and that leads to a huge amount of um, pointless spending within our healthcare systems. It's one of the reasons why, why you see this dramatic cost inflation in healthcare. And that's really providing the impetus to, to move towards stratified or personalised uh, medicine. And what I mean by that is using an individual's genetic profile um, to determine the, the course of action um, in, in the treatment of, of their disease. And that's a goal which has been about 20 years in, in the making at this point, um, birthed from, from the ambitious plan to sequence the first human genome. Um, and that progress in, in being able to identify an individual's particular genetic circumstances has coincided uh, with a significant change in the way the treatment of cancer is, is being approached. Um, and that's a result of developments in the field of immuno-oncology. Um, instead of directly trying to treat a cancer, um, trying to work out um, why a patient's immune system hasn't done what it should have done in the first place and, and finding a mechanism to, to, to make it do that. Um, so we see more than 70 new drugs come to the market in the past five years. And some of them have been revolutionary um, for, for, for some of the patients that, that take them. So as an example of that, um, 10 years ago, life expectancy on a diagnosis of advanced melanoma um, um, was, was uh, um, six months. Recently developed immuno-oncology drugs, um, which, which co-opt the immune system to fight the cancer, are so effective that in around about one-fifth of cases, um, um, this, there's, there's talk am um, among experts that the patients are effectively cured. But the critical point there is it's in about one-fifth of cases. So if you get sick, understanding your genome, understanding the molecular basis of disease is a really important piece of evidence for doctors um, seeking the most favorable treatment plan for you. Um, and, and in cancer, genetic tests um, can lead to successful drug treatment rather than radical surgery. And that brings us to, to gene sequencing. Because the biggest challenge for us investing in healthcare is that we've had two requirements um, for, for a company to be a potential investment. First, we, we want it to improve clinical outcomes for patients. And second of all, we want it to take cost out of the healthcare system. Um, in an environment of perverse incentives um, and rampant cost inflation, it's been pretty difficult um, to find a company that, that satisfies both of those criteria. But one significant exception has been in gene sequencing, and specifically Illumina, which has been instrumental in the more than a million-fold decline in the cost of sequencing over the past 10 years. Sequen that's allowed sequencing to become much more prevalent, and it's the cr critical enabler of the, the more personalized approach to treatment I've been talking about. Um, and it has, it has huge potential in, in cancer treatment. So, so to give you an example of that, and doctors are currently trialing a technique um, called liquid biopsy. <coughs> That's effectively a blood test for cancer. So at the very early stages, um, tumours put out into circulation in, in the bloodstream some of their DNA. And that can now be measured with incredible um, precision. 
there isn't currently a way to screen for cancer in, in otherwise healthy individuals. Um, current technologies aren't as sensitive or as, as specific as doctors would like. And that means diagnosis often doesn't, doesn't come um, until a, a later stage when there are symptoms. Um, but we, we know that treating at an earlier stage um, has a significant Im improvement on, on prognosis. So a screening program and early detection could, could save many lives. And that's an approach that um, was theoretically possible, but um, um, far too expensive if you only go back two or three years. But it's the exponential progress in the technology, the associated costs um, which are rapidly making this commercially feasible. So what, what are the challenges? Well, if you're going to do this successfully, you have to sequence the DNA of hundreds of thousands of people. And it's hard to convey just how much data we, we're talking about here. There, each of us has three billion base pairs of, of DNA. So you're talking about quadrillions of, of bits of data. Um, so it's a task that can only be done if you have access to vast data storage capabilities. And of course, there's no way that a human could sensibly extract information from, from so much data, which means you need advanced machine learning expertise. So bringing this full circle, um, one of our holdings, um, Grail, did um, a private fundraising recently. It was the biggest um, private raise by a biotechnology company of all time. And it was no surprise to me, at least, that, that our co-investors in this opportunity were companies like Amazon, uh, Tencent, that the CEO, um, the founding CEO, was, was formerly an engineer at, at Google. These big technology companies have moved right uh, to the heart of, of driving progress in healthcare. I think one consequence of, of our much deeper understanding of, of biology of the cell is that we're increasingly going to use biological processes uh, for industrial ends. Synthetic biology is breaking out of, of university labs, finding its way into commercial processes. Um, and and um, the drivers of this are, are pretty predictable, actually. Um, key is always um, cost. It's been possible to harv harness the, the power of microorganisms for industrial processes for, for decades. Think um, fermenting in beer or, or enzymes in, in washing powders. Um, but it's the fall in the cost of genetically modifying cells that is allowing a much wider variety of, of applications. Um, given this, the stage, nascent stage of development of, of this technology, all our holdings in this area are in, in private companies. So Ginkgo, which sits in, in the middle of, of, of that picture, um, has been one of the, the, the key enablers of driving down the cost of this technology. It runs biological processes on an outsourced basis. Um, so that's the type of automation we've, we've seen for, for years in semiconductor fabs to drive down unit costs. Um, and its, its clients are already using its um, services to produce ha very high value fine chemicals, um, things like rose oil synthetically. Um, a more tangible example um, of this would be, would be bolt threads. So the image on the, um, on the right-hand side of the, the slide um, is a dress from Stella McCartney's uh, 2017 summer collection. She famously refuses to use uh, any um, animal products in, in her fashion range. Um, this dress is made from spider silk, uh, produced by, by one of our company's bolt threads. However, no spiders were used in, in its production. <laughs> in, instead, spider DNA um, has been used to make the, the proteins synthetically. And, and I think that type of approach holds a, holds a whole new era in another very traditional industry, um, garment manufacturing. So I want to, to finish up um, by, by talking about investing in some of these big changes. Um, my, my remit today was to, um, was to talk about some of the impacts, but you have noticed I've consistently come back to, t to talking about companies. If you look on, on this graph, um, you can see the best performing and the worst performing stocks um, that we've, we've owned in Scottish Mortgage over the past 10 years. Um, so the, the saints and the sinners, if you like. 
Um, and what you can see is that, that we've made some pretty stupid decisions. Um, we've, we've owned some stocks where we've, we've pretty much lost all of our, our shareholders' money. Um, but you can also see that these losses barely register when compared to the returns from some of our most successful investments. And that's, that's the beauty of equity investing. You can make a lot more if you're right than you can lose what you're wrong, than, than you can lose if you're wrong. Um, or, or as George Soros said, it's not whether you're right or wrong that matters. It's how much you make when you're right and how much you lose when, you, when you're wrong. Now, earlier this year, an academic working in Arizona State University published a paper looking at 90 years of, of US stock market data. And over that sort of time horizon, um, the results of the skewness are really, truly pretty remarkable. So there are about, there, there about um, 26,000 stocks that traded over that 90-year period. Um, they created excess value of about $32 trillion. But half of that value came from just 90 companies. All of it came from less than 1,000 companies. What that tells you is that most companies actually really don't matter very much. And a small number uh, matter a huge amount. Um, I was, I was um, chatting uh, just before the, the presentation with, with one, one member of our audience. He was, he was talking about um, Michael Moritz from Sequoia. Um, he, a hugely successful uh, investor of, of the past couple of decades. And he made the, the comment that um, the, what he has exploited is our inability to imagine just how great um, the greatest companies can be. And I, I think that's what, what this chart tells you. So if that's the structure of stock market returns, our job is to seek out the very small number of companies that have the potential to deliver that type of return and maximize our chances of holding it for long enough that that, that return accrues in, in our portfolios. Um, if you take the example of, of Amazon that, that came up, um, has, has come up quite a few times, um, we, we bought this holding in, in 2004. It's, it's been a very successful investment for us. Um, but actually, it's not been an easy investment. We bought it in 2004. It had fallen um, by a third in value by 2006. Um, in 2008, it, it fell by half to 2009. So there have been times that, that, that even our most successful investment has, has made us look very stupid. Being able to endure those types of periods is what makes very long-term investing so, so difficult. Um, I want to finish up my prepared remarks by, by talking about a trend in the portfolio that um, has been developing over the past five years. And that's the, the growth in the number of holdings that are not listed companies. Um, so what are we up to? Well, it's a consequence of some of the things I was talking about at the start of this presentation. Um, the costs of building a new company have collapsed. You don't need capital investment anymore. You can outsource your infrastructure to some of these big technology companies. Um, your audience is now the three billion people with, a, with a mobile, an internet-connected mobile device. So breakthrough companies can achieve huge scale with very little capital requirement. And that means these companies don't have financial investors sitting in their, in their boardrooms putting pressure on them to go public. They're staying private longer. They're avoiding the, the burdens of public markets. They're being selective um, um, in, in choosing their investors and then listing on a time frame to suit them. So we think you have to think carefully about, about your role in that type of environment. Um, for us, I think we, we have two important assets. Um, the first is our reputation as long-term supportive custodians of companies. Um, that really matters. We've put a lot of effort in, into trying to get to know the companies that are in the, the late stages of the venture, venture capital pipelines. Um, and just because these companies don't want to go public, it, it doesn't mean they don't necessarily want to raise capital, either to provide liquidity to early backers or, um, uh, or to, their, to, to, to allow their employees to take some cash out. Um, and our, our second asset is our structure. Being closed-ended um, means that we don't have the life-limited constraints of a venture fund um, or the liquidity constraints of, of an open-ended fund. Um, so so we, we can genuinely say to these companies that, that, that we can invest for, for the very long term. Um, 
So I think we're well placed to, to navigate that new world. Um, I think we're also able to do something genuinely different. It isn't easy to get access to these companies and most of the available structures uh, to invest in them um, come with very high costs. But at Scottish Mortgage, we're taking advantage of our um, scale, of our low cost base to invest in these companies um, without incurring, incurring any additional costs to, to our shareholders. Um, so it all gets wrapped into the, the, um, the ongoing charges ratio of 37 basis points. Um, so I think um, I probably ought to stop there. Um, thank you all very much for, for your time this morning. Um, I, I hope I've conveyed to you the reasons why, as long-term growth investors, um, we, we look forward to the future with, with such great optimism. Thank you.